everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Own the Moment podcast. Today, we are recording the ultimate guide to NFL all-day rumble strategy with two of the absolute sharpest minds in the game. We've got Justin Herzig and John Jackson with me here today. Justin, we'll start with you. How are we doing? Rocking the rumble shirt to support the cause. You love to see it. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. It is a what, Wednesday, we are recording this a couple days early. Uh, season has been very exciting. Uh, we are, what, eight, almost nine weeks under the belt. Um, Rumble's been kind of, I think, dictating a lot of the just uh, uh, strategy aspects of the season. We're seeing a lot of excitement, um, really just a great kind of, um, you know, just a lot of the work, a ton of work that went into this, but uh, great to see and great kind of feedback from the community around, hey, putting those all-day moments to work. And from Momentum Labs, we have Mr. John Jackson, a.k.a. John Boy Beats. John, thanks for joining us today. How are we doing? Yeah, excited to be on with you guys. I, uh, I've i loved the idea of Rumble ever since it was first announced. And, uh, you know, the first, uh, what, eight weeks now are under our belt. We're halfway through the year. So I think it's a good, it's a good time to uh, kind of uh, put our heads together here and try to put together a little bit of a strategy guide on, on how uh, best, to, best to kind of attack it. Yeah, I love it because you were kind of like one of, the, one of the first people to really dive in from a data element, use kind of your, you know, your backbone, the same things you've done for the top chef of the NFL all day and take a, a, you know, a data focused approach to it. And I think that, hey, now that we're almost like, you know, halfway through the season is interesting for, hey, having these discussions about what we kind of thought, what we have learned early on and what we can do from those kind of early weeks to adapt going forward. And hey, as we're getting into these jolly joker, you know, uh, token gate at these exclusive, these high prizes. Um Let's take those learnings and let's adapt them. All right. Yeah, today we are going to cover everything from the high level about Rumble, the rules of the game, how it works, talk about some basic fantasy football strategy in general, things like game theory and ownership percentages. How do we apply all of these strategies to the weekly main Rumble contest? And then, as Justin alluded to, how can we approach some of these smaller field multi-entry token-gated rumble contests that are going to be happening in the near future via the Jolly Jokers. And we've got the the two best people in the business to help us out with that. So I'll uh, I'll kick things off here just with a quick summary of of what is rumble for people that that maybe are not familiar and then then we'll go from there. So we have a, an article up here on the Own the Moment website that gives a high-level overview of rumble that everyone can check out. But Rumble is a, a game that adds utility to your NFL all-day moments. So using your collection from Dapper Labs, if you own any moments from a player, you'll be able to use them in your Rumble roster, which consists of eight spots. You'll have one quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, one tight end, a flex, which can be running back, wide receiver, or tight end, and then a DST+, plus, which is eligible for any NFL all day moment outside of a skill position and then just gets associated with the team in accordance to the the moment that the team identifies with and then there's also a little bit of a of an extra bonus where you get three points for a, a win if you have that in the defensive position so that's kind of the the basics there we also have the Rumble Hero. So for each Rumble roster, you're able to designate one slot, the Hero, which can be a rare or legendary moment. And then that player gets 1.25x of a boost on their score. So definitely a, a strategy element there in terms of how you allocate that Hero spot for each lineup. In terms of the scoring system, pretty standard fantasy football scoring, typical full PPR. Uh, I don't think there's anything crazy to write home about there other than as we said, with the DST+, plus, pretty standard defensive fantasy scoring, except for there's also a three-point bonus for the win. And I think that's that's mostly it. Every single week, there's uh, there's two more things. Every single week, there's $10,000 in prizes available in non-withdrawable Dapper Balance, $1,500 up top to the winner of the main contest each week. And one last thing is the Rumble Wrinkle. So how this works is that every single Sunday at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, that is when the contests lock. However, you can use any player, any moment that you want to, including those that have already played 
on Thursday night or if there is a London game in the morning or a Saturday game as well. That's just kind of an extra strategy element where uh, you can play the marketplace in addition to the game. So you can choose to use someone from a Thursday night game and know exactly how many points they will be scoring there. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe John leveraged that this past weekend playing some Evan Ingram. Um, or at least I saw in the marketplace you made a purchase. Did you play Evan Ingram in the tight end yeah. slot for this week? Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, that was uh, definitely something that I wanted to talk through tonight as we get into it, because Evan Ingram actually popped up in the London game on, you know, early Sunday morning. Right. And so that is actually where I think uh, there's definitely a bit of an edge. Uh, you know, we've already seen it, I think, three times this season. And I actually think there might be one or two more London games coming up. But just having that extra game of, you know, knowing the results before it locks. Um, and, you know, I think in general, the wrinkle and, and being able to use the results from Thursday night are underutilized by the field, but definitely the London game, the early morning do, don't happen enough. I mean, I, I mean, this was a bad tight end week altogether, right? I mean, Mark Andrews put up a dud, um, on Thursday night, Travis Kelsey wasn't on the slate. Uh, and you know, there wasn't any, you know, scream and values projected. And so Evan Ingram put up, I think 15 points, uh, you know, early Sunday morning. And when I plugged him into what, what I was projecting, I was like, you know what, that's probably going to be pretty good, uh, of a ceiling outcome for tight ends that day. And, and so I went and picked him up and, and plugged him in and, uh, he ended up the second highest scoring tight end on the slate. I, I think, uh, Pitts was the only guy that, uh, that ended up beating him out, but you know, where you, we start to get, you, you start to lean into the edge a little bit is Mark Andrews, who put up six points on Thursday night, was more owned than Evan Ingram was in the tournament, right? He was, you know, seven and a half percent. Evan Ingram was like 7% or something. So like that, that's, that's kind of crazy to me to think about, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's fantastic. And I mean, even if we look at what was the DST plus for this past week, was it going to the top of my head, but was it Arizona that put up, um, do you remember the amount of points? It might have ran around. I, was, I think that was uh, in week seven. They had two weeks uh, ago, I think, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Right. Uh, okay, yeah, so two like weeks ago. But yeah, Arizona Thursday puts night, up yeah. that like 20 some points. Like that's a fantastic score for defense. It's very cheap to get an Arizona DST plus because there's so many of the players and predominantly they're like, you know, defensive, uh, not in high demand. And they were still only input into, I think it was around like, Oh, it was less than half of lineups and it was even substantially less. Um, and I think that right yeah, there, 30, was 32%, cut. I just looked up 32% yeah, owned in week seven, uh, 20 and, and points for, from defense. For me, that was a bit of the litmus test of, okay, how many people are actually paying attention to the rumble wrinkle? Because if you are paying attention to, you know, and kind of using it, you know, elementary strategy, strategy, there's very little reason not to have played a 20 point defense locked in for very, you know, virtually free on the marketplace. Uh, so I think that tells us that, hey, about a third of people are paying attention to this rumble wrinkle, which for the people who are watching this podcast, I mean, listening to this podcast, watching the show, the people that are kind of, hey, in the weeds, part of Momentum Labs, using OTM Premium, using the kind of the discords and such, there's your edge and you already know two thirds of the people, they're not paying attention. Yeah, I was just clicking, clicking through the week seven teams the leaderboard the top nine finishers all had the arizona dst plus locked into their their roster so what yeah would, i mean would i definitely of, think navigating what that. would tenth of finish if they locked in arizona <laughs> or the, yeah. the one up they, there that they, did it. they played denver and got four so they would have had 16 more points and they would have won <laughs> they would have won there you go that's great yep. yeah they would have won that is that is something so yeah, I mean, de definitely a a strategy to be utilizing there. I, I think it makes it a good point that in in our little bubbles of the the people that are subscribers to either OTM or Momentum Labs, and the people that are watching this video, like definitely edge to be had there. I think there's there's probably a good portion of the field that maybe doesn't even fully understand that the the Rumble Wrinkle is is a thing and that it is a, a part of the game. I know that I still see questions about it. So again, that's why we wanted to put out content like this to make sure that the people that that are looking to take this seriously and, and get every advantage that they can are aware of all the little different strategic elements. And the, the, the wrinkle is definitely something that is unique to this game that does not exist in any other 
fantasy formats out there. So definitely agree. It's a, a good good starting point to review and something that people should be aware of and, and make sure you're you're following us and following John to get those tips each week. Yeah, no, I think that sounds great. And I mean, I'd love to hear from John. Um, I mean, hey, you're getting to play this on a weekly basis. You're, you know, talking to uh, all of your community and kind of people on Twitter and anywhere around this. What does your process look like uh, for you personally? And then kind of, hey, what do you, if people ask you like, hey, for advice or help kind of, how do you talk them through it? What's that process look like from a strategy, projections, ownership, all that? Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, I think it's it's definitely a, um, a, you know, a, a little bit of a process for sure, just to try to wrap your head around the general like mindset for Rumble, right? And so, you know, because it's not a salary cap type game, right? Like on a DraftKings or FanDuel or something like that, you know, you really can, you know, just play the best plays, right? And, and um you you can have as loaded of a lineup as you want you know at the beginning of the season you know Jonathan Taylor and Christian McCaffrey were you know 35 percent 40 percent owned in all in all lineups for the first couple of weeks just because everybody was was jamming the best players and so um you know one of the things that I went through um early on in the preseason was I was like okay because we know you can play the best plays like how good are we or or how good can we be at like figuring out who those best plays are right and so um what i looked back i just went through like the last uh i think it was like the last year uh, i went through 2021 and i just looked at okay like how many times um you know how, how many different players finished in the top two like at the running back position right um and it throughout 2021 there was 24 different players that finished in the top two right um but then, you know, and so that makes up over 18 weeks, there's 36 spots there that were occupied by 24 different guys, right? And so like, that's a pretty wide range of like variance within that top two. Um, but within the top 10, right, which is like, you know, 180 spots, there was only 59 players. So there's only a pool of like 60 players that made up that top 10 every week, right? And so, uh, and, and a similar thing happened uh, throughout uh, wide receivers as well. There was a lot less variance, you know, within the top 10 necessarily, you know, relative to like the top two. And so basically like my initial advice is like, hey, we're not going to be that good at like figuring out exactly who the top two are every week. Right. But we're probably going to be better at like figuring out who's going to land in the top 10, like who's going to project well and like land near the top. Right. And so if you are able to kind of condense your, your player pool down at the beginning of the week and not just lock in on, you know, Jonathan Taylor. Right. But understand that like, you know, from Jonathan Taylor all the way down to, you know, Dalvin Cook or Najee Harris or whatever, like these are the group of seven or eight guys I think have a chance at top, you know, at, at a top two score. Um, you, you know, you can kind of look at projections, you can kind of look at ceiling, all the stuff. But if you condense your player pool a little bit, then you can start really paring it down a little bit more with ceiling outcomes, with you know, projected ownership and trying to find some leverage there. Um, but I think I think that's an important thing to like think about is you know, we, we have to have like the ceiling outcomes in, in a contest like this, right. It is, you know, with a, with, you know, with a GPP or a, you know, a tournament style thing where you want to be the top score, you need to have, you know, you know, the best outcomes of the players, right. You need to have like the top one or two guys at every position for sure locked into your lineup. Um, and so, starting there and being able to like cut out a bunch of players who probably don't have a potential to get into that range um i think is is an important place that i start with every week just trying to narrow down my player pool to like you know maybe 10 guys at every position uh even less at some like at tight end you know and so when you weigh that against like your actual all day collection um do you kind of go into it knowing like hey i'm gonna have at least one of all of these what about rares and getting that bonus aspect or is it more kind of reactive and it's a, Hey, first I'm going to start with the projections and the players. And then I'm going to look to my portfolio and go, Oh, well, I have this player. I don't have this player. Maybe I can get this player. How's that kind of dynamic play in? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think at this point, like my collection is pretty, I, I started in the off season, just kind of mainly hinging towards like the better players. Right. I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't spend too much time speculating. I probably lost out a little bit of opportunity there at the beginning of the year with when everybody was able to, you know, sell different pumps and stuff. But I didn't really do too much of that. I just kind of focused on 
uh, just buying like, you know, one or, you know, two moments of all the, all the better players. And so right, right now I, I feel like I have a pretty good uh, collection of like, you know, the top, uh, you know, five or eight uh, at every position. And then as, you know, kind of the projections come out or like as people get hurt, right? Like we've seen Ramondre Stevenson have some really good projection weeks. We've seen like Tony Pollard last week, really good projection week who, you know, normally aren't in the, you know, top five people that you think about, right? Then you can kind of uh, ebb and flow a little bit and, and head to the marketplace and try to try to um, fill in fill in the gaps there. But I think um, that that's kind of how I look at it. Is like it's good. I mean, we've seen with like the all day challenges, right? Like the end of week challenges are often like having to do with the top three rushers or top you know five receivers or whatever. And so just having that, um, you know. Uh, you know, collection there with that has a lot of the best fantasy players is going to benefit you on the all day side also. Love it. Love it. Lot, lot, lots to unpack there. A lot of, lot of good takes there. Um, zo zo zooming out a bit, right? I think there's, when I think about putting together a, a rumble lineup or any kind of fantasy sports contest, there's, there's projections, right? So just like, who do we, like John was just saying, who do we expect to be the best players more often than not on a given week. Then we have this concept of stacking, which, you know, maybe doesn't come into play as much in rumble. If you're just trying to jam in all of the best plays, but this idea of stacking correlated pieces in a lineup. So pairing up a quarterback with one of their wide receivers, because when they're throwing a touchdown, if they throw it to that wide receiver, you get double the points on that given play. We saw it last week with my Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Hurts to A.J. Brown. I think that was a stack that that certainly put up a lot of points and wasn't terribly high-owned from an ownership percentage standpoint, which brings me to that third piece about ownership and leverage and playing a little bit of the, the game theory angle where we're trying to find plays that have a high ceiling and have a great chance of being – the top one or two scorers in their position, but are going to be less owned by the field, right? And, and looking at last year's or last week's scores, Alvin Kamara was a great example of that at just 10% ownership, which in Rumble is is a really high leverage spot for a top end player. And I don't remember if he was, if he was the highest running back score. If he wasn't the highest, it had to be, it had to be close um, up with probably with McCaffrey. But yeah, between projections, stacking, ownership leverage, definitely important things to be thinking about as you're you're putting together these rumble lineups and you know also as you're kind of navigating the marketplace and looking to to build up your collection, having those different stacking options, having quarterbacks and wide receivers paired together, waiting for the time when they have, you know, an extra juicy matchup or a, a high scoring game environment on a given week. Those are the kinds of things that uh, I think are super important to be evaluating as you're putting together your strategy each week. Yeah, I think I think maybe talking about the stacking is one to dive into a little bit more because that might be something that you know people in the DFS world, uh, you know, in the best ball world, that we kind of understand how that works and why that helps you achieve some ceiling outcomes, helps you kind of lower you know, the number of things you need to get right, but maybe people who haven't uh, dove into that too much uh, may not understand the benefits from it. But basically what stacking is, what TJ's talking about is, is you're just pairing up, like in, in Rumble, you're pairing up, what I like to do is just, uh, you're pairing up the quarterback with a wide receiver from the same team, right? Um, you can also potentially bring it back with a re receiver on uh, the opponent, right? And you're basically just saying, hey, I think this game is going to be a shootout. I think whenever Josh Allen is going to throw touchdowns, it's going to go to Stefan Diggs. Uh, and, you know, maybe this week they're playing Kansas City, so I'm going to include Travis Kelsey as well and hope that game just scores 90 points and a ton of points go through those guys, right? Um, and what that does is that, like, that takes your Rumble lineup, which is, you know, uh, is it eight, eight or nine different players? I forget um, off the top of my head, but you know, a nine different, you know, piece parlay and it breaks it down into like a seven piece parlay, right? Because if you get that one game, right, that takes off, you know, three of your players out of, uh, you know, out of what, of what you need to hit in order to get to the top. And um, it just kind of leverages and increases your odds a little bit of, of chasing up the leaderboard there. And so typically when I'm playing uh, every week, I'm always going to pair up 
the quarterback with at least one pass catcher. Um, and, and typically I'm not going to go with the double stack. I'm usually just doing one. Um, but, you know, and, and trying to find those scenarios where there is like an alpha receiver on the team, right? Like like a great example for my Packers last year would have been like Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers, right? Because any time the Packers would have scored 30 points, right, it had to have gone through Devontae Adams, right? There's like just nobody else on the team who was doing anything, right? And so like you think of like the Cooper Cups, the Justin Jeffersons, um, even Adams this year who's had some up and down weeks. Um, but and, and like an AJ Brown, like you brought up last week uh, with Hertz, like those are all just great examples of those guys who can – really go off like now uh, hopkins with kyler murray like everything's going to hopkins right and so like these alpha guys who are just gonna like if their team scores 30 points we know they're gonna probably score 25 or 30 fantasy points themselves like those are where i want to try to put my bets on justin any any thoughts on your end when it comes to to stacking in rumble as it may relate to to traditional fantasy Oh, you're on mute. That looks like Justin maybe it's having some, <laughs> some, some. We'll talk about the, uh, so while we're waiting on Justin, I, I want to talk about the leverage a little bit too. Um, Cause you were bringing up some leverage spots, right? And so like, yep. There's 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 a, an angle to, to leverage things right where you're talking about the Alvin Kamara 10% owned right which you know compared to I think Derrick Henry last week 47% um, Saquon Barkley 33% like those are huge discounts uh, on you know uh, being in lineups uh, relative to where other studs are right and so like that's an angle to have leverage right and you're just saying hey like there's no way that Saquon Barkley should be there's it, there's not three times the chances that Saquon Barkley is going to outscore Kamara, right? Like maybe that's a coin flip. So if pro, Kamara is projecting to be um, relatively low owned, then that's kind of a great spot to just go to Kamara over Barkley. But another interesting spot for leverage is to try to understand which players are going to be popular um, and then to try to go to like the opposite side, right? So like a couple weeks ago when um, – Eckler was like, I mean, Eckler's just been amazing this year, right? He's like, the, he's the top scoring running back in fantasy. Um, and he seems to score like freaking two touchdowns a week. But, you know, there was a, a couple games in a row where Eckler was hot and Keenan Allen had been out, right? And, and the Chargers were in a pretty good game environment. I forget exactly who it was. And so I knew Eckler was going to be popular. So instead of playing Eckler, I played uh, Justin Herbert and Mike Williams, right? And so in the event that Eckler fails, right, and he doesn't score two touchdowns or he doesn't get 150 yards rushing or whatever it is, um, then not only do I just, like, have a different running back and I gain some gain some points there, but I'm saying, hey, I still think the Chargers are going to do well here. Like, they're still in a good game. They're still probably, you know, maybe going to score 35 points or whatever. And so if, if Eckler fails, then who's going to do well if they score – points right it's going to be herbert to mike williams probably right and so you know i don't think it worked out for me i think eckler still had three touchdowns that week and, and the bet didn't pay off but if you know if it did go my way and all of a sudden now my lineup jumps you know 35 percent of the field who have a dud and eckler like that's just that's really leaning into that leverage and that's those are some areas where you can really start to kind of see that running back first you know receiver quarterback leverage and really really lean into that yeah, no, I like that a lot. And I think as we see ownership go up, as we have some really studs um, and a combination of both high performing and fantasy, but also widely available with moments, because that does, you know, does play a role. We want to make sure that there are a lot of the moments so more people can play them. Uh, that's when those leverage spots do come into play. And uh, again, yeah, you either want to go full leverage and hit the double leverage with that stack, as you mentioned, with the Herbert Mike Williams or so. Or if you're, you know, hey, going off of a running back, maybe you have a high upside guy like, you know, Christian McCaffrey is going to become very popular. Maybe you go with a Debo because Debo can still get a touchdown or two on the ground, comes leverage off of Christian there. Uh, and so I was looking a little earlier on, like, we've had eight weeks so far. How many of those weeks did a stack win? So week one was Mahomes Kelsey. Uh, week two was a Jalen Naked. We, naked meaning does not have a stack partner. Uh, week three was Lamar and Mark Andrews. So both the first two stacks were with one of those elite two elite uh, tight ends. After that, we had two straight weeks of Josh Allen without any stack partner there. 
Um, and then you had two straight weeks of Burrow and Chase, Burrow, Chase. And last week was Jalen and AJ. So five out of those eight weeks were stacks. And it was either with the complete alpha, Jamar Chase, or, or their elite tight end, which the elite tight end not only uh, gives you that high upside for that stack partner, but also gives you a major edge against the rest of the field who's not playing an elite tight end, who's probably getting substantially fewer points. So if that elite tight, tight end gets off, you can still pull out some huge upside with other one-off wide receivers. So I think there is like uh, even more in this system because when we think of traditional DFS and salary cap, if you play Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews, you likely have to go cheap at wide receiver somewhere else. That's not the case in Rumble because you can play whoever you want as long as you own their moment. So that's why I think there's actually substantially about, there, there's substantial unique value in stacking these high upside tight end scenarios because it's a lot easier to pick a one-off elite wide receiver than a one-off elite tight end. And then for the ones that there was not a stack, it was a Jalen and two Josh Allens. Uh, both of those have substantial rushing floor. And so I think that's where, you know, if you don't want to stack, the best way to do it is do it with a guy who has the ability to probably get a rushing touchdown, 50, 60, some plus uh, rushing yards. So he can still have that high scoring QB week without being fully dependent on a specific wide receiver. I'm going to throw Lamar in there. I'm going to throw um, like Kyler. To think Kyler. Kyler will get there, right? Yeah. We're, we're starting to see the, the Cardinals renaissance. Now that we've got now that we've got Hopkins, at least he's got yeah. like a reasonable pairing. Seems like an alpha option. there. And then if you want to go a little off the board, I mean, Daniel Jones had 100 rushing yards two weeks ago. Uh, Justin Fields has been a top five QB, I think, in – the last three weeks or three of the last four weeks, something like that. Uh, so there are sign of some uh, rushing QBs that we're not thinking of as those core, you know, elite guys that, Hey, in the right matchup, if you want to get a little contrarian. And I think this really comes into play when we get into these multi-entry contests where, Hey, if you've just got that one free to enter contest, like, yeah, go with Justin Fields or, uh, you know, Danny Jones, a little, maybe too off the board. But when we're starting to talk about these multi-entry and, hey, maybe now, hey, you have three entries into the extra point and we'll get into. I think that's where going a little contrarian off the board really makes sense. On TJ, one of the things that you talked about was the was, you know, kind of like using projections. And I know on the rumble, like when you're building your lineup, there's kind of the built in projections there that help get a feel for. Um, you know, generally where players are projecting to do that week, right? I mean, we've got projections on Momentum Labs as well. I mean, you know, I, I don't really think like the accuracy of projections is necessarily like that important to try to figure out, but right. But but using projections to kind of be directionally correct on like how players are trending for that week is super beneficial because what it does do is get you some access to maybe some of those guys like, like I brought up the two examples of Ramondre Stevenson and Tony Pollard uh, over the last two weeks who like, you know, were, were just really great projections. Like, like on my sheets, they were like basically within the top five, top four guys. And um, you know, we're, we're going to come in significantly under owned compared to them just because they're not as popular of a name, right? They're not as, they're not as well known in the fantasy industry. And so using those projections um, and, and then, you know, what, what we kind of see is like going off of this whole, like, you know, leverage and, and trying to kind of be a little bit contrarian and make a unique lineup is, you know, there's going to be some weeks where, uh, you know, in the DFS world, we say the chalk hits, right. Where all the good projected people do well, uh, the scores are really high. You have to have those popular guys in your lineup uh, in order to, you know, get to the top of the leaderboards. And as a result, generally like the scores across the board are much higher right and so uh one of the things that that i track on my sheets are just like how the scoring is done every week and so uh like week two and week five were some of the highest scoring weeks on the platform and i, I don't have the exact players in front of me but you know all the a lot of popular players did really well that week and so because of that you know the 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 top the top place finishers had to score on the 240s you you can you compare that to week three where uh, none of the chalk hit, right? A lot of the popular players failed. A lot of the projections, you know, didn't come in where they were at. And the number one lineup only scored 198 points, right? So that's like a 45 point swing based on the week before. Um, and those are kind of like the, the weeks that, you know, you're trying to look for as like kind of a contrarian player, right? Is is where you don't have to, you, you can make that small pivot from, you know, a Derrick Henry at 50% to an Alvin Kamara at 10%. 
and Derrick Henry fails, and all of a sudden you just jump 50% of the field, right? And like you you piece a couple of those together, and you, you know, your maybe your lineup wasn't perfect, right? Maybe like you didn't have the nut to a Tyreek Hill stack this week or the, you know, the Jalen Hurts, AJ Brown, but because you hit a couple of those leverage spots and because a couple of the other guys failed, the rest of your lineup didn't have to be as perfect and you still performed well. Right. So th that's kind of the, like the, the, the plus of always playing a little bit contrarian is when the, when the popular guys fail, you're going to have an a, a ability to get to the top of the leaderboard and not have as perfect of a lineup. And yeah, and so I know in the Lumetta Labs, you keep track of those various cash thresholds for how much you needed to either min cash or hit those various levels. Um, is there anything actionable that you would really coach on that or preach, or is it more of just kind of a hey reinforcement of there is value in going contrarian? Yes, it's not going to happen every time, but in those scenarios, just as you laid out, like it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the main takeaway, right? Is like you know using some of that historical data isn't going to like, it, it, it does help reinforce, you know, looking back through and being like, okay, I don't always have to like play the top projected guy in every single spot. Right. And I, I don't always have to feel like my lineup needs to be perfect. Right. If, if I can make some small pivots and if those guys then don't have a good game, right? And and then if you use some of the principles like we talked about with like the leverage from a run, popular running back, you know, instead play their, you know, popular stack or, or vice versa, um, then you can really start to see how you can kind of jump up the leaderboards a little bit there. Um, and I think those are kind of, because you know, it can definitely be a little bit tricky for, you know, people who maybe don't have a huge NFL all day collection, right? And you don't have, you don't have one of every top 10 quarterback, right? Quarterbacks are expensive. It's hard to get, you know, it's hard to get a, a good, or maybe you don't have a rare, right? Or, or whatever. But, but if you, if you can kind of like look at your lineup and you say, okay, here's some guys that have a ceiling to them, right? Here's some guys that I know can score 25 or 30 points. And if I kind of craft a good lineup here, um, you know, I, it may not hit every week, right? But but if I play it a couple weeks in a row, right? Maybe maybe there's a, a pattern that happens, or maybe there's a week that the run out helps you, and and you can kind of uh, leapfrog a little bit rather than trying to just chase like all these chalky good performances every week. I think that might that might be a little bit uh, you know challenging mentally. So I think being able to kind of hold in there and look back and be like, oh yeah, holy crap, in week three, like. I only needed 150 points to cash in week three versus, you know, week five where 215 points cash. Like it's just such a huge spread. Yeah. It can definitely be super, super dependent on the week. There, there's certainly not one silver bullet strategy that's guaranteed to work each time, but tons of, of awesome insights there. Tons of different things that, that we can, can chew on and uh, get people cashing for that, that dapper balance and the main, rumble contest each week so for anyone that that hasn't been playing definitely check it out you can head on head on over rumble.otmnft.com all you need to do is go in connect your dapper account verify your ownership and then you just need the the minimum of eight nfl all day moments in order to create a roster can enter the contest that way completely free to enter for all again ten thousand dollars available in prizes each and every week definitely should be taking advantage of that if you are an NFL all-day collector. And coming week 11, we are going to have our first version of token-gated contests via the Jolly Joker. So wanted to spend the last couple of minutes of the show here talking a little bit about the, the Jolly Joker contest and just any quick strategy tidbits on, on how things may change. So let, let me go ahead and, and first share my screen here describe what the 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 contests are here um first off the jolly jokers is for anyone that's not familiar our collection of 5000 profile picture nfts built on the flow blockchain you can go mint one today at jollyjokersnft.com using your dapper wallet the jolly jokers comes with a a ton of immediate utility it includes lifetime access to otm premium for both NBA Top Shot and NFL All Day OTM Premium launched at the beginning of this month. And on top of that, we've got all kinds of token gated contests going on. We've already run a couple of small contests for people that are already minting jokers. I think we've given out five or six pairs of NFL and NBA tickets thus far. 
And we are going to be kicking off our series of contests with $100,000 guaranteed in prizes. So here is, is how that breaks down. The total prize pool is broken down into to two series of contests, the first of which takes place during the regular season. It's an eight-week cumulative set of contests where you'll create your lineup, and each week the scores will accumulate, and whoever has the most cumulative score at the end will be the winner. And then we will also be running a playoff contest that uh, some of the details of that are TBD, but two-thirds of the prize pool is going up front in these regular season contests. A third of it will be going in the form of the playoff contests. And then there's different tiers depending on how many Jolly Jokers you have minted. So we have the extra point, which is for people that have minted one or more Jolly Joker. We'll talk about that in a second. Then we also have the field goal, which has the largest prize pool of 50% for people that mint three or more Jolly Jokers. And then the touchdown which is for people minting six or more Jolly Jokers. And what we have here is two different dynamics. We have a dynamic of multi-entry, which comes in play with the extra point contest. And then we have this dynamic of smaller field contests, which we will see in the field goal and the touchdown, both of which are single entry, but will have much smaller fields than we've seen thus far in Rumble. Okay, that's the high level. We're going to start with the extra point contest. So the extra point contest is, is the main one. How this works is that for every Jolly Joker that you mint, you will get one entry into that contest. So if you've minted three Jolly Jokers, each week you will have three lineups that you can enter into Rumble. So for John, it would be John Boy 1, John Boy 2, John Boy 3. You create your lineups. You get your scores for each of those. Each week, you then create a new lineup associated with the previous one. And for the lineups within a single contest, you cannot use a moment more than one time. So if you own one single Justin Jefferson moment, you can play that moment in the main Rumble contest and in the extra point and in the field goal and in the touchdown. You can play it in all the different contests. However, you can only play it one time in the extra point. So if you have multiple lineups, in there, you can only use that Justin Jefferson one time. I think that's really going to add some some strategy and definitely give some benefits for people with the larger collections. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's kind of the main thing there. And then we've got the smaller field, field goal, and touchdowns. I think that kind of sets sets the stage for what these contests will look like. Uh, Justin, maybe I'll I'll kick it to you first in terms of of your reaction to the Joker contest and what that will look like. And then we'll get John's thoughts as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, I wrote up an article a week or two ago, kind of talking through some of the uh, elementary kind of the, the, the first off like strategy, you know, um, you know, since I'm not able to participate, I at least want to pretend and play through the strategy elements and have that kind of aspect. Uh, and it was just fun to kind of think through like what I would be doing, like from a, um, you know, from a strategic sense of, Hey, where I go stacks here, would I go more contrarian? Uh, so highly recommend reading that, check out that article on the, uh, OTM site, but at a high level, I mean, I think the recap is, Hey, with the multi-entry, I think, yeah, you're going to be competing against, uh, we'll, we'll see whether it's a thousand, whether it's 1500 or so, um, different entries. Um, you know, you may want to go a little more off the board. Uh, anyways, no matter how many are in these contests, it's still going to be substantially fewer than we see in the free uh, Rumble contest that's been having, what, like around 5,000 all the way up to 7,000 early on in the season uh, entrance. So there's going to be some strong value here just being in. But I think as you have kind of multi-entries, it really does you know, behoove you to start going a little more contrary and a little more off the board. Maybe you play that one, hey, here's my favorite one, here's my best moments in this. Uh, and then the other ones, I'm going to go a little off the board and uh, mix it up some. So I think that's really fun from like an extra point with the multi-entry. I think for the others that really comes in is like, hey, when you're playing uh, that free to enter, the large one, um, you know, hey, top 300 cash, you're competing against like 5,000 or so people. So like you're having, I don't know, like less than 7%, maybe around 5% or so of people actually cashing. And if you finish 300 in first place, it's the same thing as finishing in last place. You're not getting anything. And so in the main free to enter one, like that big one, yeah, you want to go 100%. Just go as good, go for the top. And if you don't get the top, 300 first is the same as last. For these, it's season long. So 
getting 300 first is very different than getting last place. And so it's maybe you don't want to go just full, full tournament, full contrarian, full, you know, high upside, because maybe you want to take a bit of safer approach and say, Hey, my goal is actually, I'm going to try to finish in like the top 25% each week. I'm going to let other people get crazy. And maybe as the season goes on, if I'm doing really well, then maybe I, you know, I stay with the, what I stay, stay the path, go with the chalky guys, go with the top ones. If I do poorly early on, I maybe I now take a couple more risks, a couple more strategy. But because each week matters and a getting to zero, having a dud score, getting a really bad week, that hurts you just as much as like the other weeks as they you know do really well may help you. Um, that whole body of work across those eight weeks makes it really interesting. And yeah, for that field goal, for that touchdown, like payouts are going to be pretty flat. So uh, you're really going to want to kind of uh, weigh the upside with the safety. I think it's interesting. I think like, um, you know, with the multi-entry specifically, there's a couple different ways you can approach it. I think you can you can kind of do like what you were talking about, Justin, where you say like, okay, you know, I'm going to maybe, you know, let, let's say I have my three entries, right? So I'm going to play kind of a, you know, chalkier entry, right? And then maybe I'll I'll take a couple swings, like a couple pivots, and then maybe I'll take a really contrarian approach. And then, you know, as you kind of see, okay, here's how these three lineups ended you know, this week, and then you kind of shuffle that around, you apply the same thing next week, and you kind of just, you know, try to navigate there based on how your results went. I mean, the other the other way to maybe look at it is like, okay, if we're getting towards the end, right, and maybe you have a couple shots on goal, um, and you've got, a, you've got a couple lineups that are maybe trending towards the top, okay, now you like really, maybe you buy an extra Josh Allen, right, and you like really lock in your two lineups, right, you build like you know, pretty identical lineups, you maybe make like one or two small pivots, right? And you say like, okay, instead of Diggs here, I'm going to put Tyreek Hill or, you know, instead of Kelsey, I'm going to do Andrews here, whatever, right? And like, you really try to just cover all your bases there once you get towards the end um, and, and and really try to get those, you know, those high score guys in there. I think, I, I just think there's a really uh, cool ways to try to figure out how you're going to approach those multi-entries. And it's definitely going to be, it's, it's definitely going to uh, benefit people who are, you know, really kind of locked into the game theory of it and understand like, you know, when it's like, if you, if, if you enter one of your lineups and the first like, you know, three weeks, it kind of duds out. Well, then, you know, it makes all the sense in the world to just take huge swings every week. Right. And like, it doesn't make sense to ever play Christian McCaffrey or does it, you know, you're hoping for that Miles Sanders three touchdown week, or you're hoping for uh, you know, a random Patriots receiver to score two touchdowns or something and, and to, to really leapfrog everybody. And whereas, you know, if you start out hot, then you're really taking a, maybe a more conservative approach and trying to play it safe. So I, I think that's going to be fun for sure um, to try to figure out. And then like, you know, when you get you start getting to the smaller fields too. I mean, uh, you see you see this in DFS, right? If for people who are playing the you know the the really big contests uh, that are the, the or sorry the really big contests you know entry levels that are really small fields, you start to know like what the field's going to play, or you start to understand like hey, like yeah, probably in this contest, like even though the projections are saying, you know, maybe this guy's going to be 20% owned, probably in this contest is going to be like 60% owned or whatever. Right. And so like, you can probably get a feel for like what those people in that lineup are, are going to lean towards every week as the season goes on. And, and you can really start to tailor, you know, your lineups there. And so uh, I think there's a lot of potential there for people who are kind of willing to dig in a little bit uh, and, and really kind of dig into the spreadsheets, dig into the, you know, the projections and, and try to find an edge. I mean, I think there's, there's going to be plenty to find. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think right now I don't have the latest mid numbers, but it's something only like 25 to 30 people would be eligible for that touchdown contest. So that's like 25, 30 people for $13,000 and you know, the regular season. And then, Hey, another $7,000 contest in the playoffs. Uh, for the field goal one, I think we're looking at around uh, maybe a little more than 100, 100, and 100 or so. And again, like, hey, that's competing for $33,000 now plus another $17,000 later, $50,000 combined. Uh, that's not bad for that small field. Uh, and yeah, I think it's, you'll, you'll start to get a feel for like what you know, maybe it's not like, oh, this individual person is doing this. But you'll see, OK, Christian McCaffrey 60 percent owned. And next week he was 60 percent owned guess what? Next week, he's probably going to be 60% owned again. And so now like you can actually take the behaviors, the cumulative behaviors of that competition, of that group and kind of, hey, start going contrary. And like, 
think about how valuable it will be from a DFS perspective to know what the ownership was going to be each week. Um, yeah, matchups are going to play some role here, but at the end of the day, like Christian McCaffrey, Justin Jefferson, Cooper Cup, like those guys are matchup proof. That matchup doesn't matter that much when salary doesn't really come into play. So I don't think ownership is going to substantially change week over week other than buys. And uh, I think TJ, can we queue up? Uh, do we have the prize pools available so people could we could just talk through and see like the structure wise, like you know, hey, for that touchdown for that field goal, it's pretty flat. And I think for all three contests, um, I don't know if you if you have it on the screen yeah. or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, yeah, all three them. contests. Got them right here. If you finish, yeah, if you finish top hundred, you're guaranteed at least a hundred dollars, and then keeps climbing up from there. Um, but lots lots of opportunity, especially for those, you know, that field goal one and the touchdown. Yep. Yeah. So here, here's a breakdown of what the payout structures are going to look like for each of them. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we obviously don't have the final total entry numbers, but for the extra point, 200 people will be cashing there uh, with a $2,000 up top first prize. As Justin said, everyone in the top 100 gets a hundred dollars there. Uh, so, so yeah, you've got that structure there. And then with the field goal, it's even a little bit more of an interesting dynamic because you still have a situation where the top hundred is going to be getting a hundred dollars. And like Justin was just saying, you know, there that's going to be a good percentage of, of the field likely. And so, you know, to that's me, like this 90% is kind of a, as of now. I yeah. Guess. It's like a, it's a fun, <laughs> unique structure wow. where it almost like, it's almost like halfway between like a 50, 50 triple up type and with the GPP upside. So like I, I'm personally pumped for the the field goal and the touchdown because like you guys are just saying, I think there's going to be all kinds of meta going on there. You're competing against the same people every week. There's going to be a lot of the same people in both of those contests. And then we look at the touchdown payout structure on the right, really leaning into top 25, get money since that's the biggest one. The min cash there is $250. And then once you get into the top 10, making it so that each individual ladder up is a little bit extra cash again with it being a super small field contest of course it's nice to win the money but also i love the meta games i love when you're kind of competing with the same people over and over trying to outsmart them especially with again with the field goal and the touchdown like you know the people that are are investing the money to compete in those contests they likely think that they have an, an edge in some way or another so there's going to be all kinds of fun stuff happening there but yeah here's the uh the payout structures for the regular season contest have not yet finalized the playoff ones and, and are not going to finalize the exact structures until later on. Just makes sense to, to get more of a feel for what the number of entries would end up looking like there. But these will be the locked in ones for the regular season contest. And the, and the payouts for the playoffs, the total pools is locked in. It's just how it Correct. ends up being split amongst like how many people and all that breakdown. We'll figure out when we get more idea on how many entrants will be. Yep. John, you're seeing this for the first time. What are your thoughts? I like it. I like, it. I like the uh, the touchdown. You know, one of the things that I always look at when I'm entering DFS tournaments is, is 10th place, 10% of first place. So the touchdown we're looking at, you know, 25th place is 10% of first place. So so that's a, that's nice and uh, nice and evened out. I like that a lot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good. I think the, uh, the five-figure prize for the field goal, right, is going to get the people going, right, getting – Putting 10k up top there, right, is uh, is a fun uh, fun thing to shoot for. That's definitely uh, some money that can uh, that can uh, you know, I'm not gonna say it's gonna change your life, but that's definitely gonna make your you know make your NFL season, right? If you if you take home uh, 10k, so so uh, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, uh, I like it, and I, I like uh, I like the playoff contest too. I think there's uh, gonna be some fun stuff there. I mean. I'm sure you guys are still working through exactly how the, all that's uh, going to work as uh, it gets into the later weeks of the playoffs, but definitely some strategy involved there um, with uh, how to kind of, uh, you know, get your rumble collection set up for a nice deep playoff run. Yeah, for no, sure. But I, I am noticing that there there is a typo in uh, these playoff contests here. I just noticed that now. So, ah, okay. so, so it is 10,000. 17,000 and 7,000 for the playoffs. So makes sense. It's about a two thirds and, and it adds split. up to the same. Time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, playoffs will be fun too. And like that, uh, I'm sure there'll be all kinds of different dynamics. We'll, we'll talk about the playoff 
contest uh, later. We'll, we'll have plenty of, of time for that. Do want to, we're, we're coming up on close to an hour. So want to wrap the show soon. Sorry, Justin. One of the things I wanted to talk on real quick with you guys is the hero, hero kind of strategy, right? Mm. So, um, right. you know, hero. because we we've got the one, you know, the 25% boost there for your hero score. Um, and that's definitely been pretty meaningful. I actually, um, I uh, pretty much every week, I believe the winner has used a hero except for one week. I think there was like one week where the winner uh, did not have a hero. Um, I haven't done any analysis on like the top, you know, 10 lineups or 20 lineups or whatever, but um, obviously getting those, you know, boosted scores, uh, you know, taking a 30 pointer up to a 40 pointer or something like that is going to be pretty meaningful. But um, one of the things that I have been tracking is like hero usage generally overall. Um, and so like, uh, it, it's only about like 60, 40, I would say of, of lineups that use a hero versus lineups that don't use a hero. So, um, a little bit over half of the field use a hero. And so I think that in itself is, is kind of an edge to think about, right. Is like, if you're giving up a 25% boost on somebody like, yeah, I know a rare, you know, it's maybe a little bit of a stretch, but, um, you know, if you, if you can, it, I mean, there's, there's some good players that are rare is, you know, 40 or 50 bucks. And I think that's definitely an investment worth making, um, throughout the season. And, and, you know, really where the heroes condense is in the wide receiver range. Um, so usually about 25% of the heroes are on receivers, uh, about 15% are on running backs and then about like 10 to 15% are on quarterbacks. Um, and I think that's a little bit to do with pricing, right? Because the quarterback rares are generally a little bit more expensive. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking through a couple of weeks ago when I played a Patrick Mahomes, um, and, and he's been like consistently one of the most popular hero plays uh, of the week, right? He's usually in like the four or five percent range of being used as a hero. And uh, I played him at, you know, at, at just a common of Patrick Mahomes. Uh, and I think I paired him with Kelsey or something. And, and, uh, but uh, the more I thought about it, I was like, I don't know if that was really the smartest play, right? Because if 5% of the field is using Patrick Mahomes hero, like, is there really, do I have any upside there? Like using Mahomes without the hero, right? Like, cause if Mahomes is the best quarterback on the slate, like, I'm still going to be behind like 5% of lineups in that specific category, right? Of quarterback. Um, and now obviously you, you'd kind of hope that, okay, well maybe I made better decisions than the rest of my lineup, but I definitely think that's something to kind of keep in mind when you're looking at hero is like, you know, it, Cooper cups, another example, like a lot of people use Cooper cup hero. And so, um, you know, if you're going to use a Cooper cup hero, I, I don't know. I, I, I like maybe, you know, I don't know if it makes just a ton of sense to like, like I think playing a Q so on wide receiver, I think it's fine to use a Cooper cup normal, right? Because like there's other heroes that could do better. Um, but then like, if you're using a Cooper cup hero as a wide receiver, well, then again, that goes back to the whole like conversation of, well, you know, there's, 4% of other lineups that are using Cooper Cup heroes. So now that puts more pressure on the rest of your lineup to be perfect and all that stuff. So there's definitely like a second layer of things to think about with hero, I think. Um, I'd be interested to kind of hear your guys' thoughts on that. All right. I've got one alpha move. We ready for this? Let's hear it. What, what do you got? If you're going to, if, if you need an out, if you need like, you know, a hero, you don't have one, you want one that you can feel like, hey, I can play this every week. And uh, I think, like, and it's not dependent upon their guys. Amon Ra St. Brown, $39. I just went to the marketplace right now. I'm buying one right now. So I just bought one. And uh, I can't play, but I was like, you know what? I like this. I'm going to do it. I'm putting my mouth, money where my mouth is. Um, because, A, he's getting the past two weeks since he's been healthy, he's getting a 25% target share. You just traded tra um, TJ Hawkinson away. It's not like you need him in a stack, like you need to play, um, you know, the yeah. QB aspect with him. So he can very easily go off on his own and uh, he's matchup proof. Just the way that that offense is set up, the way that like that kind of, um, you know, his role in there. So if you want just like, and go look, I mean, yeah, like, I think that's a good one, but there's probably other ones like this. I literally just went on OTM and I went like, okay, so I sorted by uh, rare moments, wide receivers, and the cheapest ones. And he was one of the cheapest ones, which is just absurd. Uh, but you could just go down the list and just from a process wise, like if you could just have one rare wide receiver that you're comfortable playing every week, uh, 
that's fantastic. You can use that as your rare. You're getting a major edge on the field and you don't need to be swapping in or worry about stacking. And to be honest, like that's probably the right balance of he's not actually being played that much, but he has substantial upside and could end up as like a top three, top five wide receiver any week. Uh, and literally it was $39 in the market. Um, so there's my alpha. If it's not that player, like that kind of process is what I think you should be looking for um, when you're thinking about like, you know, a rare aspect or uh, the, uh, the, the rare that um, here. Right I think now. that kind of, that that's a better way to highlight what I was trying to say with the Cooper Cup stuff, right? Is like, is, you, you know, you can, you can play some of these heroes that you don't need in the stack, right? And, and I think that's like a good way to do it. Like I, I, I picked up a Devonte Adams rare just because I love Adams, right? Obviously, I've got his jersey back here. Um, you know, not on the Packers anymore, unfortunately. But uh, you know, I was like, I'm probably never going to play Derek Carr, right? But I really want to play Devonte Adams a lot. And you know, when he scores 1.2 points in Week Eight, and I can make that 1.5 points, I mean, why would I not, right? Why would I not just, do that? Why would I not really, jump on that really opportunity? Value. That was rough. Really yeah, no, I, I think Devonte probably is the highest, like from a preseason projection, still where we like him. Uh, I mean, Justin Jefferson, but Justin Jefferson is probably expensive too. But like, yeah, you're, you're touching the right thing where, hey, playing a Kelsey, you know Mahomes is going to be, and you know that stack's going to be very common. Same thing with Mark Andrews and such. Um, I'm not saying not to play this if you have the rares, but you also probably need to play the QB stack. So you're just a little more limited and such. Um, but no, glad, actually, glad you brought the hero element. That was really cool. I, I actually did. So as it relates to like playing, uh, like who you should play um, in the the hero spot. So I uh, I did some research before the season on this, and I looked at like the top like twenty scores of that position, top fifty score, like one game scores of that position or whatever. And at every single threshold wide receiver outscored running back right and, and even in the ppr scoring here and yeah like on a week to week basis maybe the, there's going to be a running back that's you know the number one score overall or whatever but just generally speaking like the highest outcome of scores uh if you look at like the top 10 scoring rece receiver games of a year they're going to be higher than the running backs right and when you when you put in the uh ppr element to it right that's that you know obviously uh, helps for the receiver range, and so I'm pretty much always playing a hero that's a receiver, um, and just uh, you know really going for that upside there with the catches, right? If you have like the the Jalen Waddle week where he has like 16 catches or whatever the heck it was in week three or, or something, and you know just kind of getting that outcome isn't really going to happen as much from the running back. So so that's like a little tip that I would try to give uh, in my strategy guide is like you know always always use a receiver in the hero. Um, but obviously there's some running backs, right? There's the Ecklers, the McCaffrey's, stuff, stuff like that. The guys that catch passes that are going to have some upside too. But by and large, I think it's good to, to target receivers. Love it. Love it, love it. I think we've covered just about everything tonight, gentlemen. And look at that, coming up on, on a perfectly clean hour-long recording here. So thanks for everyone for tuning in. Thanks to Justin and John. For all of the mega sharp takes here, make sure you're following each of them on Twitter. Justin is at Justin Herzig. John is at John Boyd Beats. Also, make sure you're checking out Own the Moment, checking out Momentum Labs, minting Jolly Jokers, all of the things. Tons of, of fun, fun Rumble stuff happening the rest of the season here and for many seasons to come. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're going to get on out of here. We'll talk to you next time.